Hey, 3D MJers, this is Andrea Valdez, and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey podcast. Today, you're going to hear head coach Alberto Nunez, chief science officer Eric Helms, and injury and reduction management specialist Nick Licamelli talk about all things advanced training techniques. This includes quote unquote intensity techniques such as supersets, drop sets, strip sets, rest pause sets, sets, myo reps, and more. All the things you probably wondered if you should be doing, when to do them, or what their purpose is, the guys are going to cover it here in this episode. And before they get into it, you're going to hear a little contest prep update from both Alberto and Nick as they're both getting ready to hit the stage here in 2022. Alberto won't be competing until the later half of the year, and you can follow all of his progress over on our YouTube channel as he's been vlogging every week or two there to keep you posted. And that's at youtube.com slash team 3 dmj And Nick is actually just a few weeks out from his first show of the season as you're hearing this. And his coach is one of our other head coaches, Jeff Alberts, who is also prepping himself for a late year contest run as well. So lots going on in 3DMJ competition land, just amongst our coaches and specialists, never mind our roster of athletes who've already started showing up in a big way in 2022. We often share glimpses and check-ins from those athletes' prep journeys over on our Instagram stories at Team3DMJ. And you can learn more about how to become a 3DMJ athlete yourself over at 3dmusclejourney.com slash coaching. It's a lot of links, but, um, you know, we wanted to keep you posted. So that's enough intro for today. Let's go ahead and get into it. Here is episode 206 Advanced Training Techniques with Alberta Nunez, Nick Licamelli, and Eric Helms. All right, 3DMJers, I'm here with uh, Dr. Nicholas Licamelli and Mr. Alberta Nunez. Um, and hey, y'all are... Uh, Y'all both look a little leaner of face than I do. I feel like I, I don't necessarily look like I have a fat face, but let's just say you both look a little more sculpted. That's because you're both prepping. So first off, Nick, I wanted to ask you, man, you're working with none other than the Godfather himself uh, for this prep, which is the, fir- this is the first time you've actually had a coach ever? Yes, first time ever. Wow. So I expect you to at least be 30 pounds heavier or it means the 3DMJ is terrible coaches. <laughs> so, no, but seriously, like how, how is your, uh, how's your, how's your prep going, man? It's going well. Um, I guess I'll start with how it is working with Jeff. A little intimidating, especially when he demands that I refer to him as the godfather all the time. Mm. Um, just a bit intimidating when we're trying to get like that coach athlete relationship. Um, I never knew it was quite like the mafia uh, working with Jeff. So really have to watch what I say, watch what I do, look over my shoulder, even though we're on opposite sides of the country. Um, But all in all, prep is going well, I think. Um, No, all all, all kidding aside. If you think he doesn't have people in Jersey, you're kidding yourself. So (laughs) I'll just put, put put that out there. Um, no, man, Jeff, this is like, like you said, this is the first time I've had a coach, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great, great experience, especially working with Jeff, uh, for the first time, um, at, with, with a coach, it's, uh, couldn't, couldn't have picked a better, better coach. Um, Jeff and I just kind of meshed really well, even since working with 3DMJ outside of prep, Jeff and I just always really communicated well with different athletes and, and, uh, and, and things like that. So yeah, it's been really good. Um, right now I'm looking at the mayhem for my first competition. Uh, we have our meetup, which I'm really excited about too. Um, so yeah, going well, um, feeling good mentally, physically. Uh, we were kind of talking off air a little bit <clears throat> and we, we said how when you're extra busy outside of prep, it's a bit easier almost because you have less time to focus on the minutia and, and you just kind of set the process in place let it roll and um, and the weeks just just kind of fly by and mm. and you notice change is happening and and it's just um, so it's re- really been good that's kind of been my situation juggling two babies at home and and things with work things with um, with outside of work but it's all, all been very good no complaints here I'm enjoying the process and like I also said before when you go throughout your day and you forget 
that you're 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 prepping, um, but then something reminds you of it. Uh, I get this little rush of joy and happiness uh, when I remember that it's happening. So it's um, I'm loving the process. It's been since 2018 uh, was the last time I competed. So um, with the pandemic and and 2021 with uncertainties, I just kind of kept putting it off. So I'm really excited to be doing this again, and I couldn't be happier to have man. Team 3DMJ, not only as colleagues, but as as support in my corner. So, uh, yeah, really, really excited. Well, I fully expect you not to let the team down by not winning the entire show in July. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's awesome, dude. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing you compete. It'll be the first time I've seen you on stage. And uh, it'd be great to get back out to the States for the first time that I've been there since, geez, it would have been mm-hmm. November 2019. For, at worlds um, at worlds yep wow. so yeah man that that'll be really cool um and berto you're also in the midst of prep um so yeah you've only what are you two weeks in now because i mean nick you're like maybe less than 10 pounds over you're a couple months out but uh berto you're kind of just the beginning yeah yeah uh started yeah this saturday is going to be two weeks in mm. um and it's been oh you do it enough times you know, it goes like the first time you prep, it's like you, you're marching everywhere from day one, you know, saluting the other bodybuilders at the gym. And then eventually you're like, all right, you know, like I'll get there eventually, like no need uh, to, you know, like be that focused until you absolutely need to. So just a skill that you pick up over time, like I'm pretty relaxed about the whole thing. And the longer I can keep it that way, I, I just know that the better the product's going to be. So yeah, man. Um, I always feel a little pressure because, you know, when you do compete in the pro division, it's like, you know who you're going up against. Um, and uh, and WNBF World is going to be off the hook, especially with all those European guys uh, flying over. So, um, so yeah, they talk about incentive to just like do it right and, and uh, not get in my own way. But um, yeah, man, just... Uh, I've been doing this since 2007, dude, and it's still as exciting in its own way as, as the first time. Well, I fully expect you to win the pro division and uh, along with Nick winning the amateur. So, you know, there's, a, like you said, a lot of pressure. And uh, I think that's probably the right way to feel about it. And that's what's going to result in the best outcome. You know what makes diamonds? Pressure. So, no, <laughs> also, yeah, yeah. Seriously. We get off the stage, none of you guys are there. It's like, <laughs> well, if you, I mean, we'll be there if you won. So it's, it's, you know, there's no such thing as unconditional love in in a family. So you know, I, I don't blame you if you want to hang out with uh, Adria, the the stacked uh, Sp- Spaniard dude post show. I, I yeah, we've actually that. already got a contract written up for <laughs> a new coach based upon whoever wins the overall. Um, and actually, we've got a contract written up where we're going to subsidize physical therapy school for whoever wins the amateur. So. Um, you know, playing the long game here, make sure we have <laughs> the best coaches who are, of course, the people with the best physiques. So anyway, well, do you know, um, I was going to mm-hmm. say, do you know, what's funny is that sometimes people go into these things as if it's life or death. And in the case of the Godfather, for me, it very well may be life or death. So yeah. I'm hoping that I place <laughs> very high because as we know, the placing in a bodybuilding competition really shows how good of a bodybuilder you are. So I'm just hoping that I end up safe and sound in my home after the show and not at the bottom of the Passaic River, which is just half a mile <laughs> down the road from me. So that's, again, I'm not I'm not saying anything, any foul play with working with Jeff, mm. but he's got the nickname, the Godfather for a reason. And we'll just keep it there. And the last thing I'll say is I think just to Berto, it's hilarious that he still thinks he knows how it works. Like he's going to actually get the opportunity to get on stage not looking like he's going to win. You know, it, somewhere around six or five weeks out, um, something might happen if you're not in the kind of shape you need to be. And I won't be seeing you in that case, nor will anyone. But um, I don't. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe I should have just let you kept your illusion that you'll get the opportunity. But it's either win or Never do anything again. I think that's probably the <laughs> what we're going to see. Um, no chance otherwise. No, but in all seriousness, no, I'm really looking forward to seeing you both. Um, it's been a long time since you've both been on stage, and it'll be really cool to see, you know, what you guys can bring. Uh, and just great to see you. Um, so, yeah, speaking of, and this is going to be a really shitty, awkward transition, thinking of what you bring, which is related to your physique, which is related to training. And this podcast, we're going to very naturally talk about 
uh, like advanced techniques of training, which obviously was what we led to with our prior discussion. And if anyone questions that, you're you're a moron, and you obviously missed the easy <laughs> connection. So, no, but I think yeah, we were we were talking uh, on on uh, on our communication platform behind the scenes about what would be a good thing to discuss, and there's a lot that sits under the umbrella of like quote unquote advanced techniques, or some of them are called like intensity techniques, which I think is a bit of a misnomer. Is actually most of them add volume or get volume in with a higher density, and others are totally unrelated to that, like a partial rep. Um, or could be used for completely different purposes or uh, might be used to work around things like blood flow restriction training. But I think generally this is something we don't talk a whole heck of a lot about at 3DMJ because it, it has very niche applications. Um, and a lot of the times the way these are used is sometimes like it's very difficult to substantiate some of the, the these kind of wishy-washy approaches. Um, that are kind of loosely based around different concepts, but under this large umbrella. So, I mean, we obviously focus on kind of your bread and butter and standard progressive overload stuff, but that's not to say that there's no place for these or there's nothing to say about them. In fact, I, indeed there is. We just need to be cautious of the context for who uh, we're, we're using it and uh, the narrative around it, which is actually quite something that you would, you know, talk about a lot, uh, Nick, in your, in your physical therapy practice around some of the modalities that are used, the narrative is to why it's intended to work and what it's supposed to accomplish. And so I, I'm going to almost finish my monologue here. But a lot of the times in bodybuilding, people do things and it may have a, a decent rationale, but it's not the rationale they're using. And that can sometimes this game of telephone over time and between people leads to, to some things that really don't make sense. Um, like, uh, a common occurrence is that people would advise doing some of these advanced techniques is to try to like sharpen up like hey we need to do more supersets or more drop sets or things like that to bring out definition um and i think uh, it's probably pretty clear to anyone who listens to the 3dmj podcast that's not what's, what, what they're doing but that what you don't want to do is then be like oh since the rationale and the narrative used for this this approach is wrong then the approach itself is has no value um, and I think that's that happens a lot in kind of the quote unquote evidence based conversations is someone will will have a proposal for something based on a flawed premise and then the entirety of everything is rejected when a lot of the times you may not know it unless you're aware of the history of the sport of bodybuilding. Like this stuff's been around and preceded even some of the modern premises that are wrong, you know, <laughs> like these things have deep roots. So. So, yeah, I think I think I don't know where a good place to start with this would be, but um Maybe we just start with with the quote unquote intensity techniques. I think that's that's a nice little sub umbrella under this larger umbrella. This is apparently a very rainy day to hear on the podcast, but um, yeah. So supersets, drop sets, uh, strip sets. You know, which where you're, where, which is also like a drop set, but makes you think of taking off your clothes. But no, you're taking off plates. <laughs> um, yeah, rest pause sets. Basically, things that extend the length of a set and allow you to do more additionally forced reps. They're often called intensity techniques and that really comes down to the way bodybuilders see intensity, which is basically how hard is training. Or maybe if we were to kind of convert it into more objective terminology, the proximity to failure. And some have characterized it as being able to train past failure. And that's kind of true, but you sort of can't train past failure. And I'll, I'll get at what I'm saying, just to kind of, so we have the same kind of idea here. Um, if you need to reduce load to keep going, are you training past failure for that set? Or are you just reducing the force requirement to complete the, the range of motion, right? Uh, that That's kind of what I'm getting at. If someone else is helping you lift the weight that you can no longer lift on your own, are you actually training past failure? Or are you reducing the force requirement to keep moving? And that's kind of a, a common thing that you see in all these quote unquote advanced techniques. So they're not really increasing intensity as we know it to mean in the load or the proximity to failure with a given load. But it, what it is doing is increasing the amount of volume that you get in a fatigued state. And that, depending on the context, could be a good or bad thing. So open forum here, what do you guys want to, what are your guys' general thoughts on these approaches where you're essentially, you know, adding fatigued volume? I think my my first thoughts uh, from, from your intro, Eric, was um, how they are, they're tools, right, that we can have. Um, but sometimes maybe the athlete isn't 
shouldn't be worried about those things just yet. Uh, it's like a young athlete walking into GNC and getting a pre-workout, getting this, getting that, getting that. And really all they need to do is just train and eat protein, right? They don't need to be worrying about uh, the exact dosages of what's in their pre-workout or, or taking this or taking that. There's a time for that, maybe later down their training road, uh, their training journey. But right now, let's just stick to the basics. Um, and, and sometimes just like in the supplement uh, industry and even in physical therapy, like these these uh, modalities in, in physical therapy, like you said, yeah, maybe they have some use for a person who is doing uh, A, B, C, D, E, and then F, we throw in like one of those things. Um, but sometimes they, the, 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 uh, like the intensity techniques or the modalities, they get the headlines or they're the most sexy, they're the most attractive, um, especially when it feels like you're working hard. Because for a bodybuilder, that is the most addicting and attractive feeling is when you feel like you're working hard. And, um, and sometimes that could be the downfall. Um, you, if you go crazy in a GNC because you feel like you're investing in your health, you're probably just peeing most of it out and, 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 and wasting money when you could be focusing on other things. And similar to, um, to the intensity techniques, like they, uh, they have their place, but um, in the right context. And those are kind of my initial thoughts. Mm. Anything else you I want to add, people, Berto? People get confused when they see experienced bodybuilders using these methods within the confines of a very specific context. Like usually, usually it's very situational. And it's almost like they feel like there is a novel stimulus to performing these sort of uh, techniques. When in reality, no, there isn't. It's like under the umbrella of the same principles, basically. Uh, but there's a reason why they might be using it. So if I'm using like BFR on my triceps, like often I'll get younger guys at the gym inquiring about, you know, should I be doing that? Um, the real question is like, why are you doing that? Right. right? And mm. it, the answer would be very simple. It's like, well, yeah, I'd much rather just do a much more straightforward approach that maybe burns a little bit less. But uh, my elbows are acting up, so this is replacing my typical um, three sets of uh, 10 to 15 that I would, I would do. Um, but yeah, I think that's the big thing. It's like uh, younger lifters see it, younger bodybuilders see it as like, ooh, shiny. Like, like should I be doing that? Well, people will be able to tell, like, <laughs> this dude obviously doesn't do any drop sets. You can tell his muscles aren't very dense uh, when that, that isn't the case. That's really well yeah, said. Yeah, and when Sorry, go ahead, I was going to say when you say younger bodybuilders, I mean that's me when I when I first started out in this whole thing. I mean you dive into the magazines, and if uh, you know if you're not doing a drop set to failure every set, every re every exercise, then what is it even worth training, right? So I feel like I I, I myself have been there, um, taking it to the house every set with with these intensity techniques and. You try every one in the book and whichever one kind of feels best for you, that's how uh, that's how, how you go about it. And even to this day, like I still get that that little fire in me at the end of a set. I'm like, hmm, maybe we'll just rack the weight instead of dropping it again or doing like a rest pause or something. Um, so even to this day, you have to kind of tame that beast uh, sometimes, for me anyway. Mm. Yeah, and I think I think it's a good uh, let, let's talk about briefly the what are some of the narratives behind these because you know they're viewed as intensity techniques, which is more about the subjective overall difficulty or the feeling of training and you will get more of a burn, uh, potentially greater mind muscle connection as you're able to do more reps on something in a fatigue state so you can feel the swelling, you can feel the pump, you can feel the localized uh, mu muscle fatigue. And those aren't necessarily good or bad things, depending on the context, right? So if you believe that the harder a workout feels or the more uh, fatigue you can put through a individual muscle are positive things, then it's very easy to be like, well, why wouldn't I do these things, right? And I think what people need to understand is that, you know, a, a given set, a given workout, a given exercise don't exist in a vacuum, you know? So ultimately that can be a good thing in the context of an overall plan where it makes sense to do that. So, but I think we need to, to take a step, like you said, Birdo, like someone is like, oh, I observed this guy with an awesome physique do BFR, therefore BFR is good. But I think we need to have a much uh, 
we need to kind of go, go one layer deeper so that we understand why people do the things they do. Like you said, the good question is why would you do it? So as we go through some of these techniques, I think it's useful just to talk about like, like what do we know? And what we do know from say the traditional superset, a superset where you are taking the same muscle group and doing two different exercises back to back. Like let's say you did a, a shoulder press and a lateral raise back to back is that it is going to produce additional fatigue for the given musculature. It's replacing rest with training the same muscle group again. That's not surprising. And if you're thinking, oh, well, fatigue is good. Well, well, maybe it, it really depends. Like there's only so much stimulus you can get in a given time. So what might be useful is using some of these techniques to save time. You know, if you only have a limited window, but another thing to consider is that there's a balance between performance and fatigue because fatigue comes from a lot of different sources. When we're creating localized muscle fatigue, that's a good thing, right? Because now we're actually producing an effect which requires additional muscle fibers to come to the table and be fatigued out, and that's not a problem, right? We see that in the BFR literature, where despite the fact that we have reduced our load in half from what we might normally train with, or even a quarter, we're still getting an effective stimulus because it's producing a localized fatigue effect that results in still getting a similar endpoint of recruiting and training those fibers. However, with the wrong, or I would say the less than ideal exercise selection and limiting your rest periods and doing high reps, you can run into scenarios where the fatigue is not just local, but general cardiovascular fatigue, and it's inhibiting your ability to perform when your muscles still have more to give. A great example would be using some of these techniques on a leg day. Like if you were to superset leg extensions between sets of squats or leg press, those are some big muscle groups. And squats are basically a full body movement. And if you combine that with higher reps and you've removed your rest period, you're basically just running sprints, you know? Uh, and, and that's not the greatest way to grow. So I think there's nothing necessarily wrong with using a superset. Uh, knowing that you're impeding your performance for smaller muscle groups that are generally less fatiguing exercises if we're not going super, super high rep, if we just kind of mitigate the overall metabolic cost of it. But that's not to say, like Berto said, that it's a novel stimulus that is different or better for any reason necessarily than training with straight sets. So uh, some useful things that, 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 that operate in this world are something like a, a rest pause or a drop set. And we actually have some research to suggest in certain contexts those can produce similar uh, gains to, to normal resistance training. Uh, and when you go, well, if it only is similar to normal training, why would I use it? Well, it's because you can use less weight in the, in the instance of a drop set after that top set, or you can get it done faster in the instance of uh, like a rest pause set, or what many would colloquially call a myo rep set. And I think that that in and of itself is, is, is warranting discussion. Um, and for those who are a little more interested in performance, like I want to be able to, you know, get more reps or use higher loads, and I'm not trying to induce fatigue, but like I have strength and hypertrophy goals. There's also your antagonist paired sets, which is basically a superset. However, instead of training like shoulder press and then lateral raise, you train like shoulder press and then lat pull downs. So the you're training the antagonists of the muscles that was just being used. And there's actually some data to suggest that it results in a similar or even better performance than just doing those separated sets instead of going a b a b a b you go a a a b b b um, which is interesting suggesting that there's some kind of priming effect uh, or or active recovery effect in some way which is interesting and most of the research that's been done on this is with like bench press and rows or leg extensions and, and leg curls uh, back to back sets with just resting after you've done the pair of them so that is about time efficiency uh, and potentially about priming performance and I think that's something that is a, a great use of your time. And there's no reason unless you're just in, not quite yet in the right cardiovascular shape for that, where you couldn't use that on most exercises. Um, but there is also research suggesting that when you do it with like a, like a, if you take a squat in a row, then you start to get a negative effect. Even though the musculature used on a row is probably, or a bench is not being used on a squat, at least not directly. They're just really fatiguing movements. There's a lot of metabolic cost to a squat. So you want to probably preserve this for, lower body isolation or upper body movements or upper body isolation movements. But that's kind of a general idea of like, why would we use some of these things? They're not novel stimuli, but they could be potentially uh, time savers, which sometimes matters. I don't know about your guys' perspectives on that.
Yeah, when I when I use the super setting, it's usually because of that. Like to make it here today to this podcast, I looked at what I had on the day's list, and I'm like, okay, what matches up well together? Um, and that's really on, the only time um, is to save time, whether it's to make it to a podcast or sometimes, um, say, deep into prep. You know that, okay, I'm good for 60 minutes. Um, so I'm going to try to take this workout that might be a 90 minute workout and condense it to that. Uh, but, but yeah, in, in my case, just my own personal experience, um, supersets, I, I really only use it for that. And when I do pair them correctly, um, like you said, Eric, there's no negative effect. And if anything, yeah, sometimes you do, um, a, a little better when you, you pair up, the exercises uh, uh well the exercises mm-hmm. that are antagonists yeah i think what, what i found interesting um well, yeah so i want to echo alberto's point about the time management i mean that that's huge one of the main reasons why i would do a superset um but a lot of what you said eric about what the research shows about which ones tend to be more effective uh, i feel like we probably can all come to those conclusions just by experimenting enough like if you throw in a superset of leg extensions before squats, your quads are probably going to burn like heck, but the load and performance is probably going to go down on your squat. Um, and you're also going to be breathing heavy, right? So you're going to make note of all these things like, okay, that felt good, but I was I was gassed and I really wasn't lifting heavy loads. So if that's something that you want to do again, well, then maybe you have like a day when you squat heavy, just straight squat sets. And then maybe another another day during the week, you have that more like metabolic uh, training day. So then you throw in some of these techniques um, and you just experiment. You kind of find which ones feel best, uh, feel best for you. Um, And I think, I think that really like, like a lot of things, if we just go about our training with a little um, like critical thinking and, and, and taking all the data, you could probably figure out a lot of how these things could work um, you know, could work the best for you and your goals. I like what you said there and how you kind of differentiated like one being a little more metabolic and one being a little more like traditional tension and performance based. And, and I think some people get sucked into doing these when they have a narrative around like fatigue being the way that I grow or muscle damage being the way that I grow. And I think it's important to reiterate that as far as we understand it currently, the, the, the most solid footing for, for what leads to skeletal muscle hypertrophy is being able to produce high levels of tension in the fiber and everything else is kind of like a cascade down and effect from that. There may be, uh, you know, covariates that can improve that process that are maybe related to the, the metabolic fatigue, um, probably less so from damage. And that's, that's kind of where we sit right now. So essentially, a kind of a good rule of thumb for someone who's not trying to like dig through the mechanisms of hypertrophy in the literature and what stimuli affect what is to be like, all right, if I'm, if I'm sacrificing muscular tension, which is a little bit of an opaque concept, which I'll talk more about, um, then that's probably not a useful strategy, right? So, uh, and this does come down to that point I made earlier about what is the source of your fatigue, right? It's not really a big deal if you're doing shoulder press and lateral raises, and that's not super fatiguing to you so long as you don't impede your performance so much that the volume is super inhibited, right? Because we do have data suggesting like sets of two to four RM on an equated sets basis with sets of eight to 12 RM is going to produce less muscle growth. So even though both, I would say every single one of the reps in both of those conditions are probably doing something for you from a hypertrophy perspective, it's just not enough total volume. And when you're only doing, you know, three reps per set. So, you know, a decent rule rule per thumb is if if you're, if you're doing drops, If you're doing uh, myo reps, if you're doing rest pause, is that you probably still want to be getting like, you know, four or five reps per set to think about it on an equated uh, basis as to a more traditional set. Now, the tough thing there is now we're going to be talking about like comparing and tracking and progress. And that is where it becomes a little murky when you start using these techniques. Because I think what Nick and Berto both got at is that, you know, my, my, the normal way I use supersets or antagonist paired sets is to uh, make exercise selection and choices and, you know, shorten but not completely eliminated rest periods to where my performance is not affected. 
because then you don't have to worry about comparing apples to oranges. But once you start doing things like drop sets and reducing load, or once you start doing things like supersets uh, with the same muscle group, uh, or uh, in any kind of intensity technique where you are expecting your reps to drop off more than they would in a straight set, or your load to necessarily drop off, now you kind of have this apples to oranges comparison. So you know, I've, I've had questions over the time and related to some like blog posts or things I've said on podcasts, like, hey, I want to start doing myo reps. Uh, I'm going to do my top set of 10 close to failure, and then I'll do like three drops of you know three to six reps after that, which is these you know 15, 20 second breathers between. How does that compare to me doing three sets of 10? And the answer is we don't know. And I think it's important when you start to do something like myo reps is that we can look at the data on, on, on rest, pause, and drop sets and go, look, this is, can be roughly equivalent, you know, like one set with three drops to maybe three sets. But we don't have like solid data to say, here's the exact way to scale them together. So when you make this adjustment and you start using myo reps, you start using uh, drop sets, that's fine. But now that's a new baseline. And that's my recommendation to people is, okay, I'm starting here. Sweet. Here's my performance on, on I'm using, you know, the 30 pound dumbbells on lateral raises. And then I drop to 25, 20, 15. And that's where I cut it. Now you compare that same set schedule of drops until you get a certain number of reps. And it's kind of the same way you would have double progression. Okay. Once I can get, you know, 12 reps on that 15 pound drop, now I'm going to kick the load up or something like that. Um, and same, same wise with uh, myo reps or rest pause, you kind of look at the total number of reps you did and the total number of drops you did, and you're trying to improve upon that. And I think where the traditional bodybuilders really got this wrong is not that the use of the techniques at all, it was just that they were so much going by feel that if you ask them, okay, so Thursday last week compared to this week, did you get more total reps when you ran the rack on your lateral raises or not? And they'd be like, I mean, I got a better pump, you know, like they, they don't actually know because they ran the rack on lateral raises, you know, they're, they're caught in the moment, they're fatigued and they're chasing the qualitative aspects of the workout, which is totally fine. So long as you're also tracking the quantitative aspects of the workout. And I think, I think that's something maybe we focused on a lot more so like in the first five years of 3DMJ where these techniques were more common, people were more qualitatively focused and we were just like, Okay, listen, the, we don't use drop sets, strip sets, or, or supersets because it takes you away from being focused on objective increases in performance, which is one of the best metrics we have. But that's not to say that you can't still use these techniques and track these things quantitatively, but you just have to go through a few more hoops. I don't know if you guys see it the same way. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, I found, I found that in, my, in myself too when I was, um, when I used to use a lot of these techniques, I'm always after the set, put the weights down, feel great about myself. And then there's a little voice like, I wonder if that was more than last time. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's it's hard to track, right? You're not, you don't take your notebook out and, and write how many reps you get on each Maya rep or every drop set because you're in the moment and you can't do that. You have to focus on keeping your composure, keeping your form. Um, so yeah, I definitely found that as a limitation uh, to, to using these type of things. And the other uh, thing that I was just thinking about is I wonder if we could somehow like, because the main thing, one of the main things for me is that I want to make sure that like even how we started the, the podcast, um, if there are these modalities in physical therapy where these are these intensity techniques in bodybuilding, can we somehow um, create like a, uh, a tier, uh, a tiered approach where if we have a new a new athlete to the gym, maybe a superset is like level one. Like maybe if the person is pressed for time, but they are new to the gym, a superset of bicep and, biceps and triceps is probably going to be okay to mess around with, like far away from failure, but at least we can throw those in there just for the time saving sake. But then drop sets, myo reps, maybe that's like level two. And maybe we need to get a little bit more training under our belt before we dive into those. And then maybe above that, we have things like um, pre like precise, like exercise selection with correct, like angles of pull and like muscle length, uh, things like that. So maybe if, if there was some kind of way to like make that tiered approach for anyone who's somewhat new to the gym, I think that would help. And I wish I would have had that, uh, maybe, maybe back in the day, just to kind of put things into perspective. Mm. Yeah. I don't think that's a bad idea. And I think, um, I think some, I think it's sometimes just relegating these to, uh, like a better, 
like grouping is helpful. Like in general, I'm like, hey, antagonist paired sets, which just means choose a, choose a pair of supersets which don't interfere with one another, which I think most people can they can do without thinking about or needing to have a biomechanical understanding. Um, that's like always an option on the table. And why wouldn't you, right? Uh, unless you're just in really poor cardiovascular shape and maybe you get that sorted first before you, you know, do rows and, 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 and oppress, you know, alternating. And yeah, that's, I almost want to just normalize that because there's, there's no reason not to do it. Um, and then I think, yeah, anything basically where you are altering performance and you're accepting a level of fatigue because you're accepting it as equivalent to, to straight sets, it mostly, it's requiring you to, to get a similar level of fatigue is going to failure because you're training in this, this semi, like this under recovered state, right? And so long as that fatigue is local and not more general, and you have the mind muscle connection and ability to push, you know, th and to go there, as they might say, that's great. Um, however, I don't think that's something that a lot of beginners do. And you'll just see a ton of form breakdown. Um, and, you know, it, I, I think that's probably less than ideal. And it's certainly not necessary, which I think is a great point, Nick. So, yeah, I, I generally agree that once you start altering fatigue, it's harder to track. And it does potentially uh, change the, the recovery dynamics of something. Like there was actually a recent paper that came out not too long ago where they had these athletes do drop jumps. And the only thing they modified was the rest period. And when you reduce the rest period for the same volume of drop jumps, there was actually enhanced muscle damage, which is interesting. So fatigue created, and you know, the, the questions here is, okay, does that mean muscle damage is more biomechanical or is it more biochemical? And it's, you know, probably both. And you maybe just can't even control your landing mechanics quite as well when you're fatigued. So you incur more, you know, biomechanical damage. Or it could just be that, you know, some of the uh, metabolic byproducts are hanging around longer, which leads to a sca cascade that leads to more muscle damage. But the end point is what we really care about for this discussion is that once you start manipulating things that enhance fatigue, you're potentially extending the tail of recovery, which is going to have knock on effects on other things, even when volume doesn't change. So you need to know about that trade-off. You need to think about how it affects, like, okay, today's Tuesday. I'm coming in on Thursday. Normally I'm fine, but if I do all these intensity techniques that are going to make the fatigue higher, but get me out of here quicker or, or what have you, am I going to be good? And I just don't think a novice can know that. You have to have some, you got to have a training log to look back at, you know? So I, I would agree with you that there should be a distinction made there depending on the level of the athlete. What's going on 3MJers, Eric Helms here. Thanks for listening to our podcast. I just wanna take a second to tell you about MASS, Monthly Applications in Strength Sport. This is a monthly research review that I put out with Greg Knuckles, Dr. Mike Zerdos, and Dr. Eric Trexler. We cover the most up-to-date peer-reviewed research in the world of strength and physique sport that's directly relevant to your practice as a coach or athlete. We provide our reviews in written format, but also since you enjoy our podcast, audio roundtable reviews, where we discuss the research in depth. Finally, we also do video concept reviews where we cover a broader topic in video format for your learning. For fitness professionals, you can take quizzes on mass content and earn continuing education credits in most of the biggest certifying bodies in the fitness industry. If you want to sign up and get a subscription, head over to 3dmusclejourney.com and click on the products tab. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. We're talking now with, with bodybuilding in mind, but what about other goals? So what about endurance Ooh. athletes? Or, <laughs> or, Get out of here. Um, <laughs> like, um, high, like high uh, triathletes or people who are, are riding a bike uphill, downhill, uphill, downhill. I'm um, calling Jeff right now. This is going you know, <laughs> to sort you out. He's still going, bro. Um, he's, a tri he's an endurance athlete. So I clearly indicated that was not okay. And he's like, oh, he's all at the game. Triathletes. You know, it's not just, just a marathon. We're going to do two other endurance sports together. <laughs> this guy um but i know a lot of uh it's like the bfr research um mm. some of it deals with high level endurance athletes and these are athletes that have to deal with that muscle burn for prolonged periods of time so maybe we're not getting maybe our goal isn't hypertrophy for doing bfr maybe the goal is just to um expose the athlete to those conditions to that metabolic burn because that's what they have to do for their task or for their goal um Stepping away from endurance athletes, I had to just dip my toe in there for one second. Back to bodybuilders. One thing that um, that I've done from time to time is I would say do a set of leg extensions 
and then during for a portion of my rest period stand up and get into a front relaxed pose and maybe just hold that isometric and just kind of teach myself how to deal with that discomfort focus on my breathing um now am i am i that's probably another intensity technique, right? Like isometrics during the rest periods or something. That may be another um, another thing that someone may have heard about. But for me, I'm not doing it because I think I'm going to get extra cuts in my muscles or anything like that. It's more just to, similar to the uh, to the endurance athlete, it's more just to get myself in that uncomfortable, fatigued state and then try to hit a front relaxed pose and keep my composure because now when I step on stage, and, uh, and I'm not, it didn't just finish a set of leg extensions. Maybe I am getting fatigued up there, but I would have done that in the past with these intensity techniques. Um, so I have a bit more exposure to those, uh, conditions. I think that's great, Nick. Like basically you're just saying that there needs to be a philosophy of this fatigue should be serving me in some way rather than chasing fatigue for fatigue's sake. This is the same kind of rationale where, where a power lifter uh, for, far out from competition might separate all their squat and deadlift days because I want to perform well on both. But once we get close, it's probably a good idea for me to have some, uh, some SBD days where I'm doing all three because what am I going to do on the platform? Three singles of each. And there's, I don't want to go into the competition with this potentially inflated sense of what I can deadlift because I haven't done three squats and three benches beforehand. So... It, you're exactly right. And I think there, if you go into this with instead of seeing fatigue good, you see fatigue is fatigue. And you can therefore, you know, on a case by case basis, figure out in, in what way can I use this to serve me? Then I think that that's really the kind of mindset that you want to use moving forward. Um, and that is that can apply to all of the potential quote unquote advanced techniques where you are you know, manipulating the amount of fatigue you get, whether that's a force rep, doing more reps that you couldn't do, someone helping you, whether that is dropping load to accomplish the same thing, which is honestly, people don't realize this, a drop set and a force and force reps are basically the same thing. And instead of reducing the load on the bar, someone else is reducing the load that's in your hands by pushing on the bar. Uh, but people think of it like, oh, I'm still training heavy, you know, because because they, they, they just kind of conceptualize it differently. So anyway, minor tangent. But yeah, I 100% think that's the way people need to think about it is, is how can I how can I use fatigue rather than fatigue equals good? One quick note, one quick note. Um, just since we're talking about intensity techniques, and I'm sure it's getting folks like, Ooh, okay, I'm learning, I'm gonna apply some of this stuff. I'd say that probably the most impactful intervention in my coaching experience that I have for athletes on the training side, two things really. The first one is them for the first time ever actually tracking their performances and being objective about, you know, is this, does it just feel, not just does this feel right, does this get me tired, does this give me a good pump, but are my performances increasing over time? Um, and intensity techniques, like we said, they even for us, like when we have to apply them, it's kind of like, okay, kind of have to hit the restart button, do this this week, and then next week, I'm going to see if I made the right decisions, right? So, you know, th there's that caveat, right? And then I'd say ju just when it comes to supersets, that's the first one we touched upon and probably the, the most beginner one that someone can kick these off with. I think a... Just the natural order of, I know what I write up from a programming standpoint kind of caters to that anyways, because as I go down the list, like there is, I'm watching for overlap. Like maybe I don't mm -hmm. want someone doing a lateral raise, um, you know, if they have some sort of, even if it's of a chest press machine, you know, just because I, I don't know, you know, that, that muscle stabilizes this. I'd rather save it for the lateral raise for, for a bit later. So the natural order of, I think, a fundamentally sound training routine allows for that. I'd say, at least with the stuff that comes out of my desktop, it's going to be maybe the first movement you can't. Maybe that first movement is a squat or a leg press where it's like, okay, let's leave this one alone. But going back to the novices, I think if there is one superset that you should do, I'm, I'm just age myself with this one is probably recording your set 
and then your superset is going to your phone and seeing if everything was like in order, you know, because this is all something that like we here firmly understand. We've been doing this for a long time and your attention span and your idea of what like is going on, like it gets better over time. And sometimes like handling all these things, like one exercise to the next, like things can get a little sloppy with it, with a newer lifter. I'd much rather almost like you superset that leg press with looking at your phone to see if every rep was the same to see if the RPE was about what you guessed. Uh, I think that's um, much more beneficial. It's just the, the, the recording. It's like, man, we have these here. It's so much more normalized to like record yourself in the gym now. Like use it. It is, mm -hmm. it will change like anyone's lifting like outside of the objective measures. Like that is, I think like the ultimate novice superset. But, uh, but yeah, um, but outside of that, yeah, any program that's like well written should allow you to superset without much conflict. I think. I agree. I think the the way a good program is structured is is one where you are already thinking about overlap and 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 uh, the potential downsides of fatigue, uh, and or mitigating those negative effects. And that's also the way we you know think about what we train on different days and within session. So yes. it shouldn't be a total novel concept and i 100 percent agree supersetting looking at what you just did with what look with what you just did it's a great way to, to get immediate biofeedback so those are those are both great comments um okay so i feel like we've kind of covered this this little umbrella let's let's talk about other aspects of this umbrella um because i i don't think bfr it uses fatigue but the purpose of doing bfr is not to produce fatigue um it is normally in my opinion uh, most utilized and presented in this way, because it did come out of the literature, as ways to work around load restrictions, which, as Berto described, me also being 39, there's only so many days in a row where I can train the same movement with the same loads, with the same volume, uh, or specific joints in a certain way with certain modalities like barbell curls. They have a very short sh shelf life in my program. You know, If I go three weeks in a row of doing barbell rows, even once a week, I know that I'm going to be not, my elbows won't be happy with me. So there are things I have to do, whether it's <clears throat> an easy bar, uh, you know, single arm cable, you know, dumbbell curls, uh, or I can do barbell curls, you know, on, on a regular basis, week to week to week, if it's just the bar, which of course, because that's really light, requires me to use BFR. So I think BFR is a really useful tool to essentially any movement you think of, where the load is a problem or a barrier can be ameliorated so long as it is of course a single joint uh not always single joint but you're, it's 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 essentially not a torso muscle uh then 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 you can you can mess with it you know it's not it's not your butt it's not your your it's basically your limbs then you can you can do it so yeah uh we have an entire episode on bfr where where nick went in hard and he has done a lot of research on this so i don't think we need to spend a tremendous amount of time on this, but I do just want to open it up with the context of using BFR as a quote unquote advanced technique. I think it is generally really useful from being seen and from that perspective. And I know, uh, Nick, you've, you've, you play with this a lot clinically. You've thought about it academically. Berto, you have a lot of years of experience under your belt messing with it as well. So if there's anything else you guys want to add, so, but, but still considering this is not the BFR podcast, then yeah. I have a question yeah. if anything, cause, cause people, ask me this all the time mm. mechanistically can bfr make you more vascular that is a question that i ask myself uh often um especially in prep uh, i always wanted to to run that experiment and see um but i don't know i haven't read any literature on that um because i don't know uh so it, it can it can produce more blood vessels, like angiogenesis does happen uh, with BFR. I don't know if that translates to the stage, like the vascularity that we're talking about. Um, Unfortunately, great capillaries question. aren't visible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, um, but that's a great. Honestly, I don't see why not. Like, if it, if it's going to expose the your veins to getting flooded with with blood. I don't think he's going to hurt your chances of getting an easier pump or more vascular, but I can't say uh, definitively yes or no. Berta, let me ask you a question. Do you think I was a little more vascular in 2019 than my prior preps? 
You know what? In, I, I think specifically so. in and, my arms. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and I'd say, I mean, it's not going to turn like someone like who's not vascular into you know like this roadmap looking thing. But in you, I've seen it a little bit. Um, even Lane back in the day, like, he didn't have a whole lot of vascularity in his quads, and and he was like, yeah, I you know, got some things crawling down there now. So. Um, yeah, you know, it's one of these things that, like, honestly, people don't realize that this doesn't matter on stage. Like, vascularity, there's maybe one pose where it's like, oh, that looks pretty gnarly. But the rest of them, like, you know, everyone has a bicep vein pretty much, like, from where the judges are standing. And the muscle separation is really what, you know, captures um, what makes you look the way you look. Um, but I can understand why someone, either like, man, you know, like year into my training and unlike my buddies i didn't have that worm in my bicep you know uh, i want to expedite that process a little bit i, I guess I guess we're all of the camp like it i guess it couldn't hurt and it kind of maybe makes a little sense the the reason why i brought myself up is because i know that my arm measurements have not changed at almost at all from like oh nine um and the main thing that has changed in my arm training, which is very ancillary for me, I don't do a whole lot of arm work, is that it went from being 0% BFR from prior to 2011 to maybe 80% BFR <laughs> from that point onward. Um, uh, maybe 60 or 70 percent but is it like it's one of the more substantial changes in my in in my program and it's a nice way to isolate it. And there are definitely a few more branches to my bicep veins on the same size arm. Than there used to be and i mean it, it could obviously be related to many other things just with continued training but um and who's to say it wouldn't have happened just with the normal training i did but it is i, I have wondered that as well because uh, like 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 you said nick of course it the stress that's being imposed is one where your body is like oh i can't get blood flow here maybe i should need to improve my capacity to bring <laughs> blood flow and we have data to suggest that is the case but i don't know that that necessarily means like a, a massive branch of like you know like <laughs> It's like you know, the road being constructed, you know, like <laughs> around the, the, the cuff or whatever. I, I think it is probably primarily through increased vascularization, uh, cap capillarization and stuff like that, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, to kind of uh, speak to the um, when to use something like BFR or, or the like, uh, something like BFR. Um, uh, you know, I wish there was actually an introduction course somewhere, like in, in some kind of vault, uh, <laughs> like some kind of just in one place where there's a lot of good content um, mm. free. I, cause I, I don't really I'm not into like paying for it, but but like a free course somewhere that would be mm. awesome on BFR. Like a vault you could get access to by subscribing as like a member, like it gets you like VIP access or something like that. And then like you could go through all these courses just by being a member of it on a regular basis. Well, I don't know. I'll we'll see what Andrea thinks. But if there's anything like that, we'll definitely put a link in the description, and hopefully that'll uh, that'll that'll give people a better place to be informed by that. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, something like BFR, um, like you said, Eric, I've done a bunch of of work with BFR with Nick uh, Rolnick and the BFR pros. Um, but even so, even so, me being in that world so much. I maybe use BFR 10% of my patients in the clinic. Uh, and on my own training, I really don't use it. It's not something that I use often because I don't need it. I feel like I can tolerate heavy loads. Uh, if I wanted to throw in a little bit of a change um, just to get some more, just to, to, to maybe lessen the load for some reason. Um, or for example, like when my... Um, my daughters uh, were born and you're holding them a lot more and they're growing a lot faster than your tendons can adapt. Um, you develop some aches and pains. And, um, and so again, that, in, that load intolerance would be a great time to use something like BFR. Um, in the clinic, uh, BFR can be used even as just like a pain reduction thing. So not working around pain, mm. but going uh, kind of hard and, and, and getting that muscle to burn. Uh, and someone with, with arthritis, uh, for example, in their knee, that person most likely hasn't felt a burn in their quad in a very, very long time because that pain is so localized to their knee. And we're talking about not an athlete who has arthritis. We're talking about your everyday person who's a little overweight, doesn't really exercise, and has this nagging pain in their knee. 
But to put a cuff on their thigh and have them do a knee extension and have them feel that quad burn, that now shifts that pain to the muscle, and that's right where we want it. Um, so we can have some pretty immediate uh, analgesic effect, similar to like foam rolling. Like if, if something hurts a 4 out of 10 mm-hmm. and you roll it to an 8 out of 10 and then you get off the roller, it may feel better. Um, so BFR, uh, even if it's someone who's appropriate, I have no problem doing like a little drop set on a leg press just to get that quad burning or, or a rest pause. Um, but obviously this would be someone who has been coming uh, to the clinic uh, for a bit of time and has has gotten used to the technique, the proper proper technique with these exercises. Um, so yeah, a couple of different uses for things like that. But I think the point is they're not for everyone every time. Um, and there's, there should be specific reasons why you're using them. Um, right. for the your most knee part, hurts. I mean, your knee hurts. So I'm gonna kick you in the shin. So you don't focus on it like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty, pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Sorry. No, I think that's, 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 that's really helpful. Cause so people understand kind of the, the role of it. Um, and yeah, I, I find it, it's, it's nice cause the traditional way you use it is also a time saver. And it's one of those times where I'm a little less concerned about like the actual progression on it. Cause I know that I'm, I, I'm not perfect. Like I don't, I don't have a, like a blood pressure cuff that I use. I use like just the traditional wraps and I, I try to get it to the same subjective tightness, but I'm not actually taking like my, my blood pressure measurements to know that I've achieved the same level. So most of the time when I do BFR, I'm getting like four sets done in under five minutes. And I'm taking most sets to like a eight to a 10 RPE. Like I'm going close to failure and I'm taking, I'm also using the lower end of the load recommendation, like more like 20 or 30%. And I'm kind of just kind of the way I see it in my head is like, that was hard enough. It'll probably produce a stimulus, but I'm not really tracking my, my BFR 40 rep max or anything like that under this subjective thing. And I think that's, that's fine. Considering we primarily use BFR on movements that are not their principal places where we track load that that much you know like how much is your bicep curl going to go up even over a 20-year training career probably not much more than 20 or 30 pounds anyway so how do you track that well you you look at your row or your pull down (laughs) so anyway uh, i think um that that's probably helpful is there anything else you wanted to add berto yeah, I, I guess it's usually BFR is something that we use when we're banged up. Uh, Nick, you brought up how it can reduce pain. Um, from what I understand, there's also some benefits uh, to connective tissue from the, the exposure to lactic acid as well. So while keeping you away from the load, right, it can also, I guess it's a twofer in that you can potentially help it get better, whatever might be hurting you. Yeah, I, I did. I did just want to touch on something Eric said about um, how maybe we don't track the BFR sets. Maybe we don't track the, the the drop sets where we run the rack with lateral raises, but we can track maybe. Uh, so even in like the research for BFR, the way that they measure strength is not did you get more? Or are you are you doing more weight on your BFR? They measure. They take the cuff off on a different day and they measure like an isometric knee extension. So the BFR or the drop set or the rest pause, maybe it should be looked at more as like the act and not so much like the thing to be measured or tracked. And then you can track your bigger lifts or your uh, traditional training and see, okay, so this month I did a bit more of this technique. Did I see that increase in this, uh, this separate, uh, uh, parameter over here? Um, so yeah, I think if if we're doing these techniques and we're going to dive into them, um, probably better to just focus on the moment and then maybe have a different proxy of whether or not it's working or reaching your goal. Yeah, I, I think um, I think you probably should track when when and where you can, but I think it, we are beginning to start split some hair, splitting some hairs that may not matter. And I like that kind of paradigm of like, look, this is we don't normally think about it this way, like performance and testing are one of the same kind of bodybuilding most of the time. Um, but yeah, this is even maybe even one more step removed because there's so many elements that can contribute to the fatigue where your cuffs tight is tight. Did you get your right one on? And then it took you 15 minutes to get your left. Cause you're, you know, you're just not as coordinated and you couldn't keep it in your mouth. And then, uh, that sounds weird. And then, you know, like, so you generated 
you know, a fair amount of fatigue. Because the funny thing, if you haven't had experience with BFR, is that just the time wearing it is fatiguing. Like, you don't recover between sets. You know, that's why the standard protocol is like 40, 15, 15, 15. Like, it's not like you could do 40, 35. Most of the time, you're not going to be able to get more than like 20 on that second set. So there's this massive drop-off because of the, the inhibited recovery. So, yeah, a lot of things can affect it. Um, and, yeah, it's also quite painful and distracting, uh, depending on how much experience you have with it and the exercise you're doing it and your just individual response. So I have no problem, for example, tracking uh, rest pause or drop sets because um, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to this weight and then I go to this weight and then go to this weight. How many reps did I just get? But I do find it a little harder when I'm getting like, like, okay, let's count to 40, which in and of itself with me personally, <laughs> there's a high probability I'm going to count to 40 wrong. You know, it's just too many damn reps <laughs> while I'm in pain to... I mean, probably was anywhere from 38 to 42, you know, I probably counted an eccentric in there or something. So I think, yeah, you, you shouldn't probably be too minute with something like that when there's so many variables at play. But yeah, I think we can all pretty much agree that BFR is allowing you to continue to provide a useful stimulus when there's normally something load related that's a barrier. And it does have some of those other ancillary uh, potential options like, you know, acclimating to someone a little more pain locally, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think there there are a few other things under this um, uh, larger umbrella that are that are definitely worth talking about. Uh, we covered BFR, we covered quote unquote intensity techniques, but there is other things that people do, um, like for example, um, partials, targeted partials. Uh, I think that's something, and maybe I'll I'll lump it together as uh, leveraging our our hypotheses around functional anatomy. To, to improve exercises. I think those are things we can certainly start talking about. I'm sure people are interested in them as well, because if you're not following our YouTube channel, uh, that's youtube.com slash team3dmj, uh, you might have missed that Birdo has been tracking his training on there and some of his new uh, contest prep logs. And you'll see that he's been playing with a lot. Uh, playing is almost derisive, but I think he, he's been implementing um, some more techniques that he has found he can produce a better uh, stimulus from. And I think there's definitely, as, as more research comes out on this, we can see that we can mess with some of the biomechanics around a movement to potentially improve the stimulus. But I think there's an interesting conversation to be had here. Like, for example, I'll just throw one out here. One concept would be to uh, continue to do partials with a range of motion where the strength curve does not favor a full range of motion. Uh, and you're also training at a longer muscle length while doing so. Like, for example, a row. Everyone knows the hardest part of a row is you get your hand close to your chest. So if you use a strict interpretation of an RPE 10 or a failure, uh, that is when you can no longer complete the full range of motion of the movement uh, volitionally. So for me, you know, that means like my 10 rep max is, it just doesn't feel as hard as my 10 rep max on bench, where it's the opposite. It's harder right off the chest. You know, uh, when you can't do the rep, you can't do any of the rep. But with a row, if you were just to keep going and be like, all right, so I'm not going to touch my chest in this next one, but I'm going to get an inch away, you're potentially adding like another 40, like 40% 40 more reps. Like if you could take your, your 10 rep max and make it like a, a 14, if you're, if you're just going to like, okay, I want to at least get half a rep. But that exists on a continuum. Like when do you stop? Well, we have to draw some line in the sand, but maybe we shouldn't draw that line in the sand. So I think that's an interesting idea. And if you combine that idea that, okay, when the strength curve is not favoring the full range of motion, I could keep going with the fact that the recent research findings are suggesting that the most stimulative part of any range of motion is when the muscle is at a longer length, which is exactly what happens when you're farther away on a row, like that first few uh, degrees of, of range of motion on, on rows or pull downs, you could argue are probably the more important degrees anyway. So should we be stopping? And I think that's a... That's a challenging you know, question to answer because it really comes down to, well, how much fatigue is a good thing on an individual set? So anyway, I just want to open up that can of worms. It's a, it's a difficult one because it, it's not just are the biomechanics correct or is the function, uh, understanding of functional anatomy correct, but okay, even if it is, should we be doing it? You know, Or should I just do more sets or more days of training with, with the rows to in a traditional way and get the same effect? Or would it be the same? I don't know. Right. So a uh, big reason that I've been applying those is honestly, I'm, I've been on the quest to just lower my volume over time because 
um, if I can get the same productivity with less total reps, well, that's going to add up over the years. And as my 30s are coming to an end, it's something that I do think about. Um, it's like, how can I do this at the level that makes me happy for well, as long as possible? So again, it's not because it's a novel stimulus necessarily, but I, you know, I try to look at little gaps in my training, like for example, with my uh, medial delts, they've never really been exposed to being in the lengthened position. So I've been playing with that a little bit more. Um, this, my rows for sure. And I'll tell you what, it has been tricky. Like, okay, so like, what do I do now with my total volume? Now that I've been doing something that is, there's more density involved. It's, it's, um, it's been tricky. And I can't say that I've all the way have gotten there. Uh, and that's just because at this point, I need such a large sample of time to decide whether or not the last four months have been as productive as they would have been with a more um, straightforward approach. But, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's like I know exactly why I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and even when I look at my history, Eric, like here's here's one. You remember my funny bent over rows? I hope no one goes and YouTubes these. I, I, for an amateur, I had a pretty amazing back, you know? Yeah. And I go back and I'm like, oh, I was probably, this was probably the least efficient way thank God I was 23, but I was probably really overloading that lengthened position, right? With to say the least, heavy weights. Yeah. To say the least, <laughs> right? And I'm like, wow, okay, you know, you know, sometimes success does, does leave clues. Uh, but now we're just looking at a more controlled, more refined way uh, of doing it. Because if I did it that way, like I wouldn't be lending to my longevity. So I'm not saying go out there, folks, and you know, load it up with three plates on the bin over row. Um, but uh, but yeah, th there is a, a, a time and a place for it. And, and, you know, again, it's literally been maybe a quarter of my training that has changed. Like that, that is that is pretty, like we've been doing. I told you about Greg and the partial flies. I'm like, OK, that's that's one way to maybe make it so I don't have to do as much like flat dumbbell pressing, for example. Mm. Um, so, you know what? I think when I, <laughs> a lot of these techniques, like when you think about it, like it is. It is just uh, the, the older bodybuilder's curse, like whether it be because like we don't have as much spare time as like maybe we did in our early 20s or because we're trying to, you know, still make progress. But we just have a different set number in regards to like total reps that, you know, we estimate our joints might be good for. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting question. Uh discussion point of how the calculus changes it's not i have this recovery capacity that is far beyond my time so it doesn't really matter if i do four reps on every single set and i do every single exercise in the gym for a given muscle group aka my training for the first two years um it becomes all right i have a job kids uh and prior injuries and this training history, which informs me, maybe there was some cost to that just later down the line. <laughs> um, so what can I tolerate, which I have a better idea of? And then how do I get the most out of that constraint? And I think that is uh, that is a fundamentally different way of looking at things than when I was 22 or 21, when I first started training. So, yeah. And I, you know, I, I presented earlier, like the, this, this, this I don't know comparison of doing, you know, extending past the normal traditional point of failure on a row because you're doing partials uh, and potentially even going heavier because like you'd be surprised just how many more you can do like when i have played with this i've done one set to to, to technical failure on full range of motion rows and then i increase the load like 20 or 30 percent and then i do the largest range of motion i can uh for x number of more reps um, but you have to you have to decide to stop somewhere and I kind of roughly go like, if I'm not getting at least 50% of the row, then that's the end of the set. But it is a line in the sand. And the, the farther away I draw that line, the more soreness and muscle damage I'm producing. And this is one of the first times that I've actually had sore lats that lasted multiple days. It's been ages since that happened. And most people just don't really experience that very often. And I, I and then the question is, is, I don't know if that's, is that just a quantitatively different thing? Could I have achieved the same thing with just more days and volume of training with full range of motion and lower loads to, to accommodate that? Or is there actually a qualitative difference? 
And I don't know the difference because you really are underexposing um, the the proximity to failure at that lengthened position in that you know fully arms out in front of you position, if you will, when you're doing a just traditional rows and pull downs. And I it because if it's just a quantitative difference, then it is kind of one of these you know splitting hairs, and it makes sense because I'm beat up or I don't have as much hours of the day. But it, it does make me wonder if if maybe there is potential to unlock a new chapter of gains, and I'm being a little hyperbolic there, by doing some of the things we're talking about for certain movements, if the muscle is actually being exposed to, you know, a long enough muscle length to where the sarcomere itself is actually getting that 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 stimulus. And so there's a lot more questions that I'm posing here than answers, mm -hmm. but it is something I'm, in, I'm intrigued by, and it does give us some empirical, or I should say... Uh, theoretical understanding of how so many IFBB pros back in the days when you look at like like Victor Martinez or you think about doing doing pull-ups or you think about <laughs> Jay Cutler uh, doing bench press um, how they would do partials and and you know back when it was as simple as full range of motion is better not full range of motion is better because it exposes you to long muscle lengths which is probably a more nuanced understanding or at least the principal reason why um, it would just be like you'd be frustrated because these genetic freaks on drugs could get away with this stupid training, you know? But that might not be accurate. Like, Vic, stopping here, I mean, he's training through the long muscle length of his lat and, you know, not locking out on bench press. Like, the lockout's not the hard part, you know? It's not the point where, where you're really exposing it in a lengthened position to, to load, your pec, that is, and your triceps. Uh, so it is a... It's kind of... I've had to think differently you know, about this stuff. And, and it give, you give a little more credit to some of the kind of in the trenches things that people have developed and just kind of landed on. Berto, do you remember when I was making fun of you and Levi for doing dips um, after bench press? And there was maybe that much change. And, you know, and there's just kind of you guys just kind of, you know, flailing on it and doing like 50 reps. And I, and I was like, <laughs> what do we like... Can we train through the full range of motion? This is a tricep exercise. And I look back on that and I go, those bastards with bigger arms than me might have had something right, you know? Like, so it's yeah, kind of no, funny now. I, I think about it and, um, you know, those fully shortened positions, like I would, I wouldn't be able to exactly convey this to you, but like our, yeah, our pressing was kind of like short of lockout. And to me, I was like, well, if I go all the way, it's like I can't get as many reps like that. That thing just it fatigues me. So I feel like if I stay here, I'll get like the meat and potatoes of it and I can do more, which I saw as a good thing. And yeah, part part of it was definitely ego is like I wanted to do 225 for like, you know, like 20 reps, you know, instead of like, you know, 10 reps. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But 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 I, I can only imagine with these guys because I mean you're taking people who are just super genetically gifted. They're on unlimited supplements. Uh, they catch on things like really quick. If something is working, it's like that is working. You know, mm. they might not know exactly why and, and how to like maybe uh, relay the message correctly. Other than it works for me, bro. You know, I have three Olympias, but. Uh, but yeah, like so yeah, quite often I think especially this last thing, um, it just it's definitely like I look for them now. It's like, okay, what are the bros doing that they claim like really like, like you know, like that like removing dairy from your diet like back in the Arnold era, like that was the finishing touch, because uh, that's gonna get you um uh, thinner skin and obviously, yeah, I mean it's gonna work, but it you know through science, we were able to pinpoint that it works because there's a caloric reduction. Because yeah, all apparently there are calories in food. That, that was the the secret. Yeah, <laughs> right. So yeah, sometimes they can't tell you exactly why, but you know, sometimes like I'll go through a John Meadows binge, you know, mm. because he was a collection of uh, of those things where he was, you know, blessed himself genetically more than he gave himself credit for. Um, extremely extremely hardworking, and uh, he just had a knack for picking up on, on, on trends. So, um, so, you yeah, know, I find a bro like, uh, like John, he was kind of a hybrid bro. And it's like, it's all ears. Same thing with Jeff. Like as my volume reductions have come down, I'm like, whoa, like I kind of understand what's, what's going on here now and why Jeff uses like one set a week per body part, you know? <laughs> 
Um, Inaccurate characterization. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, yeah. So I, I guess all these other ones have been kind of like, it's not necessarily a novel stimulus. It's more so we rather not do them sometimes. But, you know, sometimes I find myself drop pre- uh, doing drop sets on my dumbbell chest press because... I know that I either don't have enough time, didn't get good enough sleep. So it's like, okay, you know, it's like I can be focused for like two minutes straight and then this is over with instead of my typical three sets or something like that. That's um, my go-to when they go, the gym closes at five, not six exactly. today. You know that? Exactly. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I look for the intensity technique that's just most appropriate for whatever it is that I'm doing. And like, that's what I run with. Uh, but but the training or being just uh, uh, just taken into consideration, like what is I guess the full range of motion for that muscle and and movements that really load that that portion of the exercise. Uh, that that's definitely something that I think for guys like us here, it's like oh okay, you mm-hmm. know maybe my lats are a little have been a little undertrained relative to you know everything else. Yeah, I think with the with the muscle length conversation, if if we don't if we're trying to find out how to apply it, that may be a couple of different ways. Like you could, Eric, like you said, you finish your set and then finish off with some in the lengthened position. But I think a good general takeaway is if you're going to do a partial, at least include the lengthened position. <laughs> um, that's probably a good like blanket uh, statement. And then the other thing that I'm just realizing here and having kind of an existential crisis is that, so you're telling me that all my times of doing 21s with curls, the top seven, they weren't doing anything. <laughs> you did 14s, no matter how many reps you actually counted, dude. Sorry. I, I, I'll i leave it there, guys. I don't know what else I have to contribute <laughs> to this conversation. <laughs> well, and that that is the, 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 the sad conclusion uh, to, to probably the majority of this podcast is that you might have wasted a third of your time when you did your 21s, folks. Um, you know, then that's time you can't get back. So just hope that your competitors also lost that time before you had this revelation, because we know that any serious competitor did do 21s at one point. And I'm hoping that the future will be that you're doing 14s. Um, so, yeah, maybe we can we can we can make that change. And uh, maybe that's the way you get the 21 inch guns is by actually doing the 14s, ironically. Mm. Tortoise first the hair, yeah. folks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we we've I think we've been all up under this umbrella now. I don't know if if there's anything else you guys want to cover. I know I've been hosting this a little bit, but feel free to take the reins if there are aspects of some of these techniques that you guys feel we have not adequately touched on. I just want to say use them as tools. Uh, keep the goal in mind. Um, I think all of them can be appropriate for the right person at the right uh, training age with the right uh, time in their training with the right goal. Um, but just don't use them because they uh because you think you have to because the biggest guy in the gym uses them just have a little bit of critical thinking um is it going to kill you if you use one just to see what it feels like probably not um but you can really implement these things to help out uh, at the right time uh so i'll probably just leave it at that uh, tools it, it's just like the longer you do this like i don't know whenever i go to the gym and there's something that's off with the equipment it's like very quickly I can just jimmy rig something and I don't even realize that what I'm doing is like pretty cool and then someone's like oh I've never like thought about that like that is what a lot of these things are and usually I think when you should start using them maybe with the exception of of the the supersets you know like we said that's probably the most novice level uh like it's going to tell you like you know you learn about this stuff and just the situation will be very clear when it's like ooh okay like i've been regressing on my tricep extensions like the last 3 weeks and the ouch is getting louder maybe this is a good time to throw in some uh, some bfr or you know, the drop sets for me like or or the myo reps they they made a comeback last prep when i'm like i could do 3 sets of 8 to 12 on the hack squat i really don't want to cuz I'm really lean right now and I'm not eating nearly as much as my body would like. Let's make a deal. Let's, let's, uh, do a, a let, let's do a my rep sequence of, uh, of two clusters and, and call it good. So yeah, I think with a lot of these tools, like you'll know when it's time to use them, like it's just going to pop up in your head clear as day. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for your input 
And uh, also thank you everybody for listening and we'll catch you next time.